again, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. All right, we'll uh, continue with the hymn of the month. Let's do um, the last three stanzas, so three, four, and five. The last three stanzas. Uh, this is about Jesus going to the cross, so very fitting for this holy week. <laughs> Unto God be praise and glory, to the Father and the Son, to the eternal Spirit in honor, now and ever more be done. Praise and glory in the Catechism memory work. I'll read the questions and y'all will say the answers. Christian question and answers 9 through 11. What has Christ done for you that you trust in him? He died for me and shed his blood for me on the cross for the forgiveness of sins. Did the Father also die for you? He did not. The Father is God only as is the Holy Spirit, but the Son is both true God and true man. He died for me and shed his blood for me. How do you know this? From the Holy Gospel, from the words instituting the sacrament, and by his body and blood given me as a pledge in the sacrament. And this, uh, the Bible memory work this week is the words of institution, so we'll say that together. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take ye, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took a cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Matthew 26, Mark 14, Luke 22, 1 Corinthians 11. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And Luther's morning prayer, I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands as I commend myself, my body and soul and all things, let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. The Almighty and the Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless us and keep us. Amen. All right. Um, kids can go off to Sunday school. On the uh, hymn of the month, um, just one final thing I'll point out about this hymn, is uh, stanza four. I, I really like the, the image here, Faithful Cross through Sign of Triumph. Um, as I just learned by sticking my finger through one of the thorns, the, thorns uh, the cross does not look or feel or seem like something that is triumphant. Right? It looks like something dead and thorny and 
um, you know, ugly in a sense, right, from the, from a world's perspective. That like, if if it wasn't for Christianity, I don't think people would be decorating their houses with, you know, the image of the death penalty from the Roman Empire. Right? They, wouldn't even, they wouldn't even remember. That. Right? Yeah, they would. They would not remember. But it'd be like. It would kind of be like today if people like decorated their crosses with electric chairs, you know. It would just be weird and wrong. Um, but the cross, through the work that Christ does on it, does become beautiful. And it does become something not only that we can decorate our houses with, right, but uh, in church, right, in church art, like we have crucifixes everywhere. Um, the cross is our symbol of life, right? It's the tree of life. It's, it looks like a dread tree, dead tree, but it's really a tree of life. And the, the image here is, is nice, right? Um, be for all the noblest tree, none in foliage, none in blossom, none in fruit thine equal be. Symbol of the world's redemption for the weight that hung on thee. Um, I just love that, right? They, like you can think of, you know, the, the great redwoods in California or the most beautiful apple tree or fruit tree. Um, any kind of beautiful, wonderful tree, and none of it compares to the tree of the cross. Right? None of it can outdo uh, or be equal to the tree of the cross. Even though it doesn't actually look like it has foliage or blossom or fruit, right? It actually has all of those things. Right? It is our life. It is our life source, and it bears fruit—the fruit of eternal life. So. I really like that that image there. All right. The other thing to know about the same is uh, this tune. Now that we know this tune, um, we're actually going to use this tune for another hymn as well on um, Monday Thursday for the distribution. Um, and it's kind of a fun play on words that we're using the same tune for both because um, the hymn that we're going to sing for distribution, the communion hymn, which we've never sang before, but it can use this tune, is now my tongue the mystery telling. Mm. And this is Sing My Tongue the Glorious Battle. So it's like a Monday Thursday and a Good Friday hymn that use the same tune. So that'll be nice. Um, it's a great hymn, Now My Tongue the Mystery Telling is. It's a Thomas Aquinas hymn, actually. So we don't like everything Aquinas did, but he did write at least that hymn that was very good. So. All right, let's uh, jump back into the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 7. And... I'm excited about this. Uh, one, I'm honestly a little excited to be done with Daniel so we can move on to something else. But Daniel 7 is, is uh, I think it's pretty important in the Bible overall as a kind of one of these significant prophecies and visions. Maybe we don't, as, as Lutherans, we don't talk about it as much because of... Our eschatology doesn't demand us to constantly study the book of Daniel, but uh, as some other churches do. However, I think that Daniel chapter 7, uh, this is a handout, by the way, from the Lutheran Study Bible. And it's a little chart comparing Psalm 2, Psalm 110, and Daniel 7, so we'll get to this. But I think Daniel chapter 7... Um, really, it's the it's in the center of the book of Daniel, and that's not a mistake. So, remember we we kind of talked about to, to review chapters one through six. Oh, it's not, that is not a six. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. I was just thinking about chapters two through seven. So, chapter uh, one through six are the kind of stories of the book of Daniel, right? And then um, 7 through 12 are the visions in the book of Daniel. But then, kind of mushed in there, we have chapters 2 through 6, which are written in Aramaic and are kind of this, this block. And if you notice, chapter 7 is comes right in the center of that. And it, it comes on the other end of the Aramaic section. Um, 
and we saw that kind of way that the two through six form these uh, parallels last week. No, excuse me, two through seven. That's what I'm saying. Two through seven um, are in Aramaic, and seven comes right at the end of that and right at the beginning of the vision section. So it, it really is the, the center and the climax of the book in some ways. Um, chapter 7 parallels so what chapter 7 is about this is uh, Daniel's vision and Daniel's vision as we recall with this 2 through 7 block parallels chapter 2 chapter 2 is Nebuchadnezzar's dream and we're going to use that to help interpret chapter 7 but that's kind of where it comes in the book, and I do think it is rather important. Um, like I said, in the, in the biblical scope of things. So I think what we'll do, some of it you've, prob you, you've probably heard before. So like um, everyone's heard the term ancient of days. <laughs> okay, so that comes from Daniel chapter 7. So we'll see that. Um, one of these, this name and vision of the Father. And it's interesting because we actually get a vision of God the Father, which is, this might be the only place that happens in the Bible where we get a vision of someone who sees God the Father. Uh, and in a symbol, we have to keep, well, we'll talk about it when we get there. We'll talk about it when we get there. Okay. All right, I'll take it. Um, the other very significant thing is, well, we'll just jump into it in a minute, but when we read through chapter 7, I want you to notice um, what the climax and the main point is. Right? So I think this is, with these kind of apocalyptic visions, this is one of the main errors that people run into, is that they get focused on the, the small details about the things that are not the main point, and they forget to interpret it from the main point, right? So I'll give you an example to kind of help that make that clear. So if I'm preaching, this happened to me on Thursday night at, or was that Wednesday? It was Wednesday, it was here. I remember I said something in the sermon that I didn't like the way it came out. I thought it didn't like um, represent our theology well. Like I said something about sin that I, I recall, like when I said it, I was like, that's not what I meant to say. And I tried to kind of like continue to talk about it enough to, to try and clarify what I was saying in the moment. But at the end of the day, like what I was saying in that moment was more of a minor point. It wasn't the main point of the sermon. Now, if someone went back and tried to kind of interpret that that sermon if they wrote out the transcript and and were analyzing it and they focused really in on that one kind of like blip in the sermon right and the, there is a difference here a caveat I'll make if they interpreted everything through that one like sentence they would totally misunderstand what I was trying to say right because I was, that's like a, it was a minor point I was making. It wasn't the main point of the sermon. And it was written, in, it was said in a way which could have been taken as confusing. Right? Well, <clears throat> similarly, when people go to interpret something like Daniel 7, which has these very detailed and kind of confusing sounding visions, and they focus in on all those details and try and interpret everything through the, through the part that is more confusing rather than less confusing, they often will misinterpret it, right? So when we read through this, what we have to do is figure out, okay, what's the, what's the main point? What's the clear message here? And then we can interpret the less clear things through that, if that makes sense, right? Now, unlike my sermons, um, 
this is the inspired word of God, right? And it doesn't make mistakes. So that's my one caveat is that the vision here, I'm not, I'm not trying to say that the, what the details of the vision are any kind of mistake. I'm not saying that by any means, but I am saying that when we read through this, we have to take, okay, what's the main clear message here, which your handout has something to do with. It's about the Messiah's enthronement. That's the main message. The vision has to do with that, right? So we shouldn't take the visions and um, try and fit them into other side tertiary things when we're trying to figure out what the main message is. Okay, does that make sense? Maybe to make that a little bit clearer, I feel like I'm not being clear. That what I'm talking about is that people use Daniel 7 to help interpret along with the book of Revelation things about the end of the world and about what we call eschatology and Jesus coming back again. And especially the our friends, the Baptists and some other more American evangelicals, um, some of them tend to be what we call premillennial dispensationalist, which is a certain view of the end of the world and of the end times. I've talked about this before. And um, they will try and match up things in Daniel's vision with very, very specific historical events about what's happening with the end of the world and Jesus coming back. And I think that can often lead to mistakes. So that's that's specifically what I'm thinking of here, right? But they miss the point about this being about the Messiah's enthronement, which is the main message which we need to deal with. Okay, hopefully that makes a little more sense. All right, Daniel chapter seven. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream. Belshazzar is Nebuchadnezzar's son. Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. Okay, now we can use these images in comparison also with the book of Revelation, which this is the other thing too. Like sometimes people read the book of Revelation and they don't study the prophets. I've said this before. But you have to study Daniel and Ezekiel, especially if you want to understand the book of Revelation, but along with the other prophets, too. Um, John draws so heavily on these images that you just don't get what's happening in Revelation without this verse. Okay, anyway. Um, the four winds of heaven, um, that's symbolizing the, the scope of the whole world, along with the great sea. That's like the multitude of everyone, right? So the great sea is like the entire world, basically, right? Because um, waters cover the whole earth. Mm -hmm. This kind of draws back on Genesis 1 as well. And so this is a vi vision of what's happening over the, over the whole earth, right? So it's a cosmic vision. And four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. Now, as we're gonna find out, and if we compare this to Daniel chapter 2, which was Nebuchadnezzar's dream, these beasts are nations, right? So you have the whole earth, and you have various nations coming up out of the earth, right? And the four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from each other. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And suddenly another beast, a second, like a bear, it was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they, and they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, and there was another, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth, and it was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling 
the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. And I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up from among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. Okay, so if we go back to Daniel chapter 2, we can see there's a very similar idea here in Nebuchadnezzar's dream that Nebuchadnezzar has a dream where he sees uh, four statues coming up, or right, this great statue with four parts, and the four parts represent these four nations, right? And as we talked about uh, last time, um, if we start with Nebuchadnezzar as the Babylonian kingdom, then we get the Babylonians, and then the Medes and Persians, and then the Roman Empire as an immediate historical reference. Now, let me stop here and say, at, just remind you, like we talked about last time, um, what we often have in Apocalypse is kind of a three-part, two or three-part, depending on how you think about it, way of interpreting these things. The first part, when we interpret apocalyptic visions, is what I, what I call immediate history. Right, so the history that immediately surrounds the prophet who's speaking such things. Now, it doesn't mean that it's not going to be in the future, but it could be in the past, it could be in the present, it could be in the future, but it's all immediately around, like, cl like closely around what is being talked about. Um, and this goes with not just uh, apocalyptic visions, but really a lot of prophecy, right? Sometimes we get in the Old Testament uh, things that are not only prophecies about Jesus, maybe they're prophecies about Jesus, but they could be prophecies about other people too. For instance, 2 Samuel 7, it's about David. It's about Jesus, but it's also about David, right? So it's a historical prophecy that has a, it has an immediate historical reference in David, but that extends all the way to Christ as well, right? And we would say ultimately it's all about Jesus, but it's about Jesus also through the immediate historical reference of David, if that makes sense, right? So when, when Samuel prophesies this kingdom that's, that's given to David, what he says there is very much about Jesus, but it's not like it's not about David either, right? So you can have a both and in prophecy. The second thing... Um, is, well, simply that, going along with that, is that the, what we're always looking for is references to Jesus and the kingdom of God. And that could be um, either or both his first advent in coming to this earth in the incarnation and in his death and resurrection, or it could be about his second advent when he comes again to judge the living and the dead. Right, so it could, when, when we think about how something, how a vision or a prophecy relates to Jesus, it could be about when he is born and lives and dies and is, and raises, and is raised again, or it could be about when he's coming again to judge the living and the dead. It could be about either of those two kind of big scope events, either his first or second heaven. The third thing, um, I'm going to call it cyclical history. Which means that we can see uh, patterns 
of something that is prophesied throughout history. Right? So, um, there's a lot in the book of Revelation and here, for instance, as well, in Daniel chapter 7, about the persecution of Christians. Okay? Now, I think that very often when John is writing about persecution in the book of Revelation, or when Daniel prophesies it here, he's thinking about it, John, um, talking about John, he's thinking about it in his own life with the Emperor Nero. For instance, the number of the beast, 666, in the book of Revelation, um, there's some kind of ancient ways to do the to, to look at how um, people would assign numbers to letters and numbers to names. And if we use that kind of ancient method of um, numerology, uh, we can see how the, the number 666 is about Nero, the emperor who persecuted Christians in John's time. Right? So I think when John is talking about six, prophesies about 666, I think primarily for him, he's thinking about Nero. Now, however, that doesn't mean that there aren't other emperors and other uh, terrorizers of Christians that we could call beastly, right? Um, that throughout history, there are, there are people who persecute Christians um, who are beastly. And you can see this, another good place is... Uh, one that comes up a lot, which kind of comes up here in Daniel 7 too, is the Antichrist, right? So um, in Revelation, you hear about the Antichrist, and everyone, everyone, all these premillennial dispensationalists, I love them, they're my friends, but they're always talking about who's the Antichrist, right? Is Biden the Antichrist? Is Putin the Antichrist? Who's the Antichrist, right? Um, is Trump the Antichrist, right? Yeah, let, let me be fair to both sides of the political aisle, right? You know? um, there are probably some leftist premillennial dispensationalists, maybe. Um, which is kind of a weird combo, but whatever. Um, it doesn't have to be coherency. Right. It, it, <laughs> yeah, people are generally not coherent, in my experience, in their thinking, so... Um, what was I saying? Oh yeah, cyclical history. So with the Antichrist, um, certainly we could say um, that maybe there will be, I think John, again, is talking maybe about Nero there um, when he says the Antichrist. Maybe there will be a great Antichrist that has not come yet, right? Like, um, that this is, and this is an important point too, when it comes to all this apocalyptic stuff, I don't have it all figured out, right? This is perhaps, it interests me the most out of everything in the Bible because it's in part what I understand the least, right? Because it is the most confusing. Everyone agrees that it's the most confusing part of the Bible is all the apocalyptic stuff. I do think I have some things pretty well figured out based on my study and comparing scripture to scripture, but... Anyway, the Antichrist. Okay, maybe there's a great Antichrist, but John himself, in his epistle, in, uh, I believe it's 1 John, talks about how there are lots of Antichrists, right, plural, and how the word Antichrist literally means someone who is Antichrist, right? It's someone who's against the gospel, who's against Jesus, who's you know, militant, uh, militantly against Jesus. And the Lutheran confessions, for instance, say the office of the Pope is Antichrist, right? Whoever uh, is, is holding the office of the Pope that is leading souls into damnation, that is Antichrist, right? That's not to say that every Roman Catholic is going to hell. Um, there are certainly Roman Catholics that have faith, but... The Pope is fervently teaching that people are saved by their good works and not by the grace of God. And therefore, he is an Antichrist. Right? Um, so, there are lots of Antichrists. Right? There are lots of false teachers who are Antichrists. There are lots of persecutors that are Christians that are Antichrists. 
So we see these cyclical history patterns, right? We see antichrists appear throughout history, right? So we see these things happen over and over, and we see wicked em empires rise and fall throughout history. And if you, another place to see this is look at what Jesus says is going to happen that's a sign of the end times, is things like natural disasters, right? And wars and rumors of wars. All of these things happen over and over again throughout history, and, it, and it's a good sign that we're in the end times. We are waiting for Jesus to come back again. Um, that's, that's what we believe as Lutherans is we're not premillennial, we're amillennial, which means that um, we don't believe in a literal timeline according to the book of Revelation of how these things are going to happen, but we do believe that since Jesus has uh, been taken to the right hand of the Father to reign, until he comes back again, we are in the end times. We're waiting for Jesus to come back again. Um, his reign is happening now, and it will come to fruition when he comes back again. But while that is occurring, all these patterns of apocalypse, of unveiling, are occurring over and over and over again. Okay, so hopefully this helps kind of make sense of things before we jump into Daniel 7, that there are immediate historical references, there are specific references to Jesus and the kingdom of God, and there are references that are um, kind of cyclical history patterns, and those things might all be in the same prophecy, right? So, like, one prophecy uh, can be very much about, all, like, can be very much interpreted through all three of these lenses, if you will. And I think that's fine, because the Bible is inspired, and the Bible is, uh, the Holy Spirit is not limited to, like, this very singular, super hyper-literal interpretation method. Right, where it's like some something can mean multiple things at once. That's what I'm trying to say. Right. And there's a lot of double entendres or even triple entendres, if you will, uh, in the Bible. Okay. So let's okay. Daniel two and seven, uh, let's compare them a little bit. So we get the four the four nations in Daniel two. And I think as far as immediate historical reference goes, yeah, Steve. Uh New King James Version? Yeah, that, okay. that's what I'm at today. Thank you. Um, immediate historical reference for these four beasts that come out of the Great Sea are the same immediate historical references we had in Daniel 2, right? The Babylonian Empire, the Medes and the Persians, and the, uh, and the Roman Empire. And the, the way that you get there in Daniel 7 specifically is one comparing Daniel 7 and Daniel 2 and seeing the similarities. For instance, the great beast, the fourth great beast that comes out of the sea has iron teeth. Do you remember in Daniel 2 what the um, material of the bottom part of the statue was? Bronze. Bronze and iron, right? It was the cheap metals. Right? So you had, well, you had gold, silver, bronze, and then you had iron and... Mixed with clay, was it? And clay. Yeah. Iron and yeah. clay. Yeah. 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 So bronze is the third. So you have, yeah, you have gold, gold, silver, bronze, just like in the Olympics, right? And then you have, um, at the bottom, the, the final empire to take the rest, which was the Romans, that is iron and clay. And they're a mixed empire, right? Um, the Greco-Romans. So... Um, that's one instance where you can see the similarities between the two. And not only that, but they're on this Aramaic block, right? So you're supposed to compare them because not only do two and seven go together, but also three and six go together and four and five go together, right? As, as parallels. So Daniel wants you to, to compare these things, I think. Um, the other way you can get there is by looking at what he says specifically about the fourth beast. And this gets us to references about Jesus and the kingdom of God, is that the fourth beast is worse than all the rest. And um, it continues to devour and continues to be uh, wicked 
Um, let me let me see here. So when we get to the to the vision interpreted, um, jump ahead to verse twenty three. So this is when the vision is interpreted for us. The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it in pieces. The ten horns are the ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom, and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the first ones. He shall subdue three kings. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into the hand for a time and a half a time. Okay. So this kingdom, in short, we could get into all the details. We just don't have time to get into all the details. Is worse than all the other kingdoms. Why would the Roman Empire be the worst of all the kingdoms? If we were to just um, conjecture that this is the Roman Empire. Well, they spread out everywhere. They, they spread out everywhere. They were certainly um, maybe the most successful at the time. Well, I think that, I mean, it was particularly the persecution of Christians... Right, the persecution of Christians, and ultimately the crucifixion of Christ. Right, right? There, this is the this is the empire that crucified the Lord and Savior. Right now, God meant that for good, of course, like we've talked about um, with that hymn. But um, the worst empire is the one that that God elected to be the hand and instrument of the death of His Son. Right. But that. Okay, so that feels very strange. That's a, that's a psychological conundrum. Because what was really is the best thing for us was that Christ was crucified. <clears throat> even though it was this yeah, really sure. horrible and terrible thing. So you have this, this pulling between how horrible and terrible it was and how actually good and beautiful yeah, it was. I th and I think we have to relegate that paradox to God, right? God is the one who works the greatest good out of the greatest evil. But that does not um, excuse the greatness of the evil, right? Like Judas, like, like take Judas for instance. Judas is not excused for betraying Jesus simply because, um, you know, God... For uh, God demanded in history that that was done, right? Like that, Judas is still at fault. Like it's his own sin, it's his own decision to betray the Lord and Savior that he is, he becomes unfaithful for. I mean, he loses all faith and ends up committing suicide, right? And it, the, the greatest sin, like, and think about Peter's sermon at Pentecost, right? Like when he's talking to the, the Jewish crowds and he says, the Lord whom you crucified, right? And they're cut to the heart. And it still cuts us to the heart too, right? When we see this, like what we do on Good Friday, when we know our things to the cross, right? Like it's our sin that puts Jesus there. And our sin is not excused just because Jesus is there, right? If that makes sense. <laughs> so, the, I mean... On one hand, yes, <clears throat> certainly the cross is our glory, the cross is our salvation, the cross is our life. On the other hand, the cross is the greatest sin ever to happen, if you want to think about it that way. It's the greatest wickedness ever to happen, right? That the, the most innocent human, I mean, the totally innocent human, the only innocent human, who is also God, was given the death penalty, right, by wicked men out of a conspiracy because they were prideful. Because they hated God. And they hated God, right? And that, I mean, that is a wicked, wicked sin. It is the most wicked sin to hate God and to try and kill him, right? And so, uh, for this, right, the, I think here we can see the Roman Empire is called perhaps the worst of all the empires. Now, you can also do some counting and figure out 
um, who all these kings potentially are. I mean, you know from the scriptures, right, there's kind of multiple different Caesars and multiple different Herods. And um, even, I think the little, there's like this little horn, the first horn and the second horn um, here in the vision. Um, there's a kind of precursor to the Roman Empire in, that you can read about in uh, First and Second Maccabees in the Apocrypha and this uh, persecutor of the um, Old Testament Christians at the time named uh, with, the, with the Maccabees that this guy named Antioch, Antiochus um, who was persecuting them, right? And I think a lot of people think that's the first horn here and then Caesar is the second horn. So um, these things do kind of match up, right? So I think that as far as kind of immediate historical reference and also reference um, to Jesus in the kingdom of God, that very much here um, in the fourth kingdom, in the fourth beast, we have the Roman Empire, and then working back from that, you can get to these other empires too, right? And um, even another place to see this is the first empire, right? Where like the first empire was like a lion that had eagle's wings, and then it was lifted up and, and able to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. That very much lines up with what we've already seen in Daniel, where Nebuchadnezzar of the Babylonians had these moments of having a human heart, right? Where he repented to some degree. So um, I think th that's where I would put the emphasis of these visions is that generally Daniel's talking about these immediate historical references. Now, as far as cyclical historical patterns go, certainly many wicked em empires have risen up and persecuted Christians, right? Now, should we try and match those up one to one? I don't think so. I think that's just... A waste of time. I think what we should see here is the general patterns that over time empires will try and outdo one another in wickedness and they eventually have to be and they eventually have to experience downfall. Right? Can I interject something? Yeah. This is just an observation I made and it could be rejected or whatever but also while it's historical and future and all that sort of things, it's also personal. So if any of you are ever converted from a heathen to a Christian like I was, you see the reality of it in your own life, who you were, and then how you became a Christian. Yeah, there's certainly, yeah, there is certainly personal application to be made here as well. Uh, I think, maybe it's just me, it's okay. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I don't think that's wrong. Um, all right, so let's get to the main point. We got like 10 minutes here. So uh, starting at verse 9 now, and this is actually where we get to the, to the main stuff. I watched till the thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. Now, um, I'll just go ahead and say I think this is God the Father. Okay, so, and his... Uh, his garment was white as snow, and his hair on the head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. Notice how similar this is to Ezekiel's vision as well, mm -hmm. right, of, of, the, uh, of God on his throne. A fiery stream issued and forth, came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. Okay, so the books being opened, that's definitely a vision of some sort of judgment, right? Um, book of life language, right, that we have in Revelation. Um, the, the other thing here is, what are these 10,000, 10,000, thousands upon thousands? I tend to think these are angels, right? Um, but these could also be interpreted as two other things, as well as angels. One would be the saints, um, that have gone before, right? So like we get also in Revelation, the saints coming through the Great Tribulation, standing with the angels, worshiping the Lamb on his throne. Secondly, this is a very, um, I, I simply do not have time to talk about this today, but I'm going to mention it, and you might think I'm crazy, but I'm going to teach about it sometime because it's really cool stuff. There's... 
Um, in the Bible, what exists in a number of different places, what we sometimes refer to as like the divine council. And it seems to be that aside from angels, there are other heavenly beings that are kind of not really angels, but also not humans, and they're not God, but heavenly beings that are what we call the, the divine council or the divine court that God kind of consults with, right? Not that he, like, takes advice from them, but that are his, his heavenly court, right? He's a, he's a heavenly judge, and think of these as, like, the heavenly, like, bailiffs or something like that, right? Like, um, they're, they're kind of like these court beings um, that they appear in a number of different places, and they don't seem to be angels. Um, I think one of the reasons we don't talk about this is because we've become very scientifically minded in the last century. I mean, old people of old used to talk about this more, um, but we don't take the spiritual realm as seriously. But the Bible, I mean, talks about the spiritual realm a lot, obviously, and it seems that there's maybe more to the spiritual realm than just uh, we, we kind of focus on demons and angels because that's what there's the most about. But there's also this, this other thing here, right? The court was seated and the books were open. Um, who's in the court? The, there's other... You have to look at other places as well to get what I'm talking about. But I just want to mention that, that um, I think here that you also get an, a vision of the divine council, which um, is quite interesting. So, anyway. Um, I watched them because... Of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking, I watched till the beast was slain and the body and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. And the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, um, okay, so the Ancient of Days takes away the rule of kingdoms from the beasts. All right, so the God the Father, let me repeat that in interpretation language, God the Father takes away power and rule from the empires of this earth. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. Then all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the one which shall be destroyed. And the choir has to leave right at the best part. <laughs> um, so, what's Jesus' favorite name for himself in the Gospels? Anyone remember? What does Jesus always call himself in the Gospels? Son, always. Son of God. Son of, man. Son of man. He doesn't call himself. Son of God, he calls himself Son of Man. And this is where he gets that. The God the Father gives the power and the dominion and the glory and the kingdom to the Son of Man. That's his son. Right? Now, interestingly here, this is the only place where God the Father is pictured as a man. Right? I mean, we know that man is made in the image of God, of course. And we see that in Jesus Christ. Um, generally speaking, in church art, you will never see God the Father drawn because we almost never get an image of him in the Bible. Jesus says, no one's seen the Father. You only know the Father through me, right? Daniel breaks the rules. <laughs> he just does. And he pictures the God the Father as this ancient of days. He doesn't say much. He just says white hair and, and white garments. Um, but that... Ancient of Days gives the key, the kingdom, to his son, the Son of Man. So when Jesus calls himself the Son of Man, he's not saying, unlike our favorite hymn, Beautiful Savior, right, Son of God and Son of Man, he's not distinguishing between his divine nature and his human nature. He's actually claiming his divine nature when he says Son of Man. Okay? And what does the Son of Man, what does Jesus receive? The dominion, the glory, and the kingdom, and all peoples, all nations, and all languages should serve him. 
So you get these little empires, right? The four beasts, you get these empires that pop up in different places in the world, or even here in one place, kind of. All of it falls away, and the entire great sea, the entire great multitude, from all four directions, right, from all four winds, is given to Jesus. And they all must worship him and bow down to him. All right? And his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. Right? There's one kingdom which is his. Now, um, basically he goes on to interpret this uh, very similar to how we've interpreted it. Or in the same way we've interpreted it, right? In the rest of Daniel chapter 7. Um, in the last five minutes, what I want to do is... So that's Daniel 7. And the... Um, well, let's just jump in. So the uh, handout that I've given you, the Messiah's enthronement. Um, this is really the climax of Daniel chapter 7, is that God the Father enthrones Jesus on, on his throne. Now, I think ultimately this happens um, at the cross, right? I think the cross is the ultimate throne of Jesus. Now, it also happens in his ascension, right? When he's enthroned at the right hand of God. And it'll happen again when he takes his throne in the new heavens and the new earth, right? So it kind of happens multiple times, um, as we've said you can have multiple kind of things about the vision, right? Okay, but this, um, the other place, and I, I point to these all the time. I tend not to point to Daniel 7 as much, I think, in my preaching and teaching, but maybe I should. Um, Psalm 2 and Psalm 110 are hugely important psalms to understand our Christology and um, what we're talking about here. If you compare... Daniel 7, Psalm 2, and Psalm 110, um, like my Hebrew professor, Dr. Steinman, uh, does here in this handout. I got to catch up with Dr. Steinman at our last pastor's conference. He's a good, good guy. Um, influential on in my thinking about the Old Testament, certainly. Uh, if you compare Daniel 7, Psalm 2, and Psalm 110 here, you can see the same pattern of how the Messiah is enthroned. Okay, so at the top there, in Psalm 2 and Psalm, in Psalm 2 and Daniel 7, um, you have nations opposing God and his Messiah. So remember Psalm 2 says, why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of themselves take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. That's Psalm 2, 1 to 3. If you want to memorize something, by the way, you should memorize Psalm 2 and Psalm 110. You should memorize, like, a lot of the Psalms, but those are two to start with. 23, 51, those are important, too. Um, there's a lot of important Psalms, but um, Psalm 2 and Psalm 110 are, are, are really good ones. Okay, so the nations, um, the four beasts in Daniel 7 emerge from the sea to rule oppressively over God's people before the advent of the Messiah. Uh, in Daniel chapter 7, um, the thing that happens next, if you keep reading, is the, what I was talking about earlier with the Divine Council. Oh, and by the way, if you want to study more about the Divine Council, um, there's a guy named, who wrote, wrote a lot about that called, uh, I meant to say this earlier, Michael Heiser is his name. And I really like his work for the most part. Um, I'm reading one of his books right now called The Unseen Realm, which is all about this. But he has a book that I think is like a much, I, I want to say he has a book that's a much simpler version of The Unseen Realm. Like it's a more like lay level, um, less of a textbook uh, version of it. But I can't remember what it's called. So I'll have to look that up and let you know. But, um, yeah, I'd look up Michael Heiser if you want to know more about the Divine Council. All right, anyway. The Ancient of Days convenes his heavenly court, and then you get the, a decree from the heavenly court in all three chapters, right? Psalm 2, Psalm 110, and Daniel 7. 
that the Son of Man is installed as the eternal king over all the nations. Um, in Psalm 2, God mocks the rebels and installs his Messiah as king to rule over the nations. And in Psalm 110, God installs David's Lord. Right, Psalm 110, we have this whole thing about David's Lord and, and uh, the son of David and David's Lord, David's son and David's Lord. Right? David's Lord is installed as king at the right hand to rule over his enemies. Right? So you get the, in, the actual enthronement as a heavenly decree from the Father and the divine council that Jesus is the king of heaven and earth. Right? And then in Psalm 110, you also get the decree that he is priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, which we've been talking about with the book of Hebrews. In uh, number E, or part E there, in all three things... Uh, you get that the nations will all bow down to the Lord, right? So um, in Psalm Daniel 7, the beasts are shorn of power and slain. The nations are admonished in Psalm 2 to serve the Lord and kiss the sun or they will perish. And in Psalm 110, the Lord and his Messiah crush the kings and fill the nations with corpses. And then finally, in Daniel 7 and Psalm 2... Um, you get the blessing of those who bow, down, who bow down to the Lord, which are his saints. That's something we didn't talk about as much in Daniel 7, but the saints actually inherit the whole earth with the, with the Messiah, with Jesus, right? Um, let me actually just turn back to that real quick. I want to read those verses. So Psalm, uh, Daniel 7, verses uh, 18. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and forever. Right? That the, the saints, God's people, who are persecuted before, get to inherit the whole world. This is the fulfillment of Genesis as well, right? That Adam is, the sons of Adam are supposed to have dominion over the whole earth. That with, the, with their Lord, they get to inherit the whole kingdom. Right? And then um, in Psalm 2, blessed are those who take refuge in the Lord, right? So, um, quite an interesting, hopefully that kind of helps uh, make sense of these things, that um, this is the pattern of human history, if you will, right? That now, in the last times, in the end times, the nations are going to rage against the Lord, um, as they did from, you know, Daniel and even before, as they did in the Old Testament. But Jesus is installed as king. And that kingdom will come to fruition when he comes again in the last day. And all the nations now that rage will one, one day have to bow. Every knee will bow. right? And the kings of this earth will, will make answer for what they've done. Right? So this is why um, I, love, I love Psalm, maybe Psalm 2 the most. That the kings of this earth must now... If they want to not perish, kiss the kiss the sun, lest he be angry, right? And so it is possible, right, to have a Christian nation. It is possible to have a Christian ruler who does kiss the sun, lest he be angry, right? It's just unfortunately rare <laughs> that we see that. But all right, any final questions on that? Oh shoot, I went over time. All right, um, any final questions, comments? Hope that was enjoyable. I love this stuff. Um, I do promise I will one day do a uh, Bible study on the book of Revelation, and we'll probably get better attendance than we do now because that's what people want to talk about. But um, this is actually the precursor, which is maybe more important. So, All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We pray that you would bless our time of worship today in spirit and in truth. And we thank you for all the wonderful gifts that you continue to give us. We pray this through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.